in the faith. We have been talking about Hebrews 11 with regard to the definition of faith, and we're going to keep going with that definition today. What is faith according to the Bible? And so we're looking today at the first thing that we read there that in Hebrews 11, that faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. We did speak last time about the assurance that faith is. That is the reason, the basis for believing something, the basis for accepting somebody's claim as true. When you have faith, you have accepted the basis of God, that he spoke his word, that he gave us truth, and truth is knowable. And it's the acceptance of things hoped for. The acceptance of things hoped for. So I wanted to look at that today especially, but it is also the conviction of things not seen, and it is also the means by which the people of old received their commendation or testimony. It's what that is, that faith testifies for them. It's a witness for them. So it is the assurance of what we hope for. It's the uh, settled conclusion of things that we have not yet seen. And it is the means by which we obtain a testimony with God. That's what faith is. So let's look together at what it is things hoped for. What is it to hope? Uh, this word is a fairly simple word that just as talking about something that is coming, that you're looking for, that you expect. Maybe you expect a train to arrive, you know? It's that kind of expect, but looking for something to happen. And it uh, doesn't matter whether that thing is a good thing or a bad thing. It's just saying there's something coming and you are looking for that thing. You're expecting that thing. My way of looking at that is to say that you know what the future holds. <laughs> uh, when it comes to a train, well, they, you know, very often they run on time in Germany, I'm told. Um, I haven't seen many of them do that here in the United States. But you might think to yourself as you wait on the platform that this train is coming. You know, in some sense, you kind of know the future. There's going to be a train roll up here. In our case, we know something about the distant future, or what appears to be a distant future, about eternity, about heaven, about uh, the judgment day. We know a lot of things about what's coming in terms of the spirit and the spiritual world. And these are the things that we hope for, things that we expect or that we're looking forward to. Now, um, I found in the study that there is at least one specific thing that dominates the discussion of hope in the New Testament. Um, and that the New Testament points us back to the Old Testament pretty much immediately. <laughs> as soon as this starts happening and as soon as this starts being talked about and preached, or prot, I don't know, teach, taught, preach, prot, I don't know. But as soon as they start doing this, they're immediately going back to the Old Testament scriptures, and they also are pointing to this specific thing, which is resurrection from the dead. They're talking about resurrection. We're talking about that there is, you know, in other words, life after death. There is something after this. There is a, a cause. There is a reason. There is something else coming. There is something else behind the finality of death, if you will. There's nothing final about it. <laughs> so the first place we'd go is Acts chapter 2. 
When the gospel is first being preached, as the apostles first receive that miraculous indwelling of the Holy Spirit and are inspired to say words by God that are, in fact, well, what gets written down, i.e. Scripture, they have a lot of things to say. But among the things that they say is... At the 24th verse, down through the 27th, God raised Jesus up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad, and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope, for you will not abandon my soul to Hades, nor let your Holy One see corruption. The other way of reading this would be, you, you not abandon my soul to the underworld, you will not let your Holy One see decay or undergo decay. Uh, the meaning of corruption is, is, yeah, decay. So the process of staying dead for a long period of time is not going to belong to this person who is speaking in the psalm that is quoted. That person is not David, as Peter will go on to demonstrate from here. But sticking with the idea of hope, it's what's quoted there in the 26th verse. My flesh will dwell in hope. My flesh, you mean my body. Yeah, my body will dwell in hope. Not just his spirit, but his body. Hope of what? As he said here, you'll not abandon my soul or my life. To the underworld, you'll not let your Holy One see decay. When he says his body dwells in hope because he won't be left in the underworld and he won't undergo decay, he's saying he's coming back. He's coming back to life. This is Psalm 16, if you're into that. Psalm 16, verses 8 through 10 is what Peter is quoting. So the first appearance of hope in the New Testament itself is a quotation of the Old Testament. <laughs> and it's of Psalm 16, verses 8 through 10, where David is clearly talking about resurrection. And Peter is the one who, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, drew the conclusion in Acts 2.24, it was not possible for him to be held by death. Why is it not possible? Well, he gives the reason why. It's not possible for him to be held by death, for David says concerning him. And here is the psalm. What's Peter saying? Well, he's saying the word of God is true, though every man be a liar. The word of God is right. The Bible is right. There is a resurrection for the Christ. It has said this since at least Psalm 16. So his death was never going to be permanent. It wasn't even possible for him to be held by death because the Bible said otherwise, and God's word is the great power in all of existence. But this is hope. He lived in hope because he knew there would be a cause, there would be a resurrection. And of course, Jesus knew what that meant too, that that would mean there would be forgiveness of sins. There would be a start of the spiritual kingdom of God. He knew what all of that meant. And so he dwelt in hope. My flesh will dwell in hope is also a way of him saying he had the strength to keep going on earth when, you know, a lot of us would have given up, I think. Everybody turned on him. Everybody forsook him. We all forsook him. We treated him hatefully. But he kept going. 
because of hope. Over in Acts 26, um, you have this from Paul standing, you know, after he's been falsely accused and dragged into the courts in Rome, um, you know, which were not known to be Lady Justice with a blindfold, let's just say. <laughs> that was not the reputation of courts at Rome. But Paul isn't really talking about his innocence or his incarceration or his rights as a Roman citizen. Instead, in Acts 26, he takes the opportunity to speak to Agrippa who knows a lot of things about the Jews. He's well-versed in this, unlike most Romans. He actually knows a lot about Judea and about the Scriptures. And Paul said to him in the sixth verse of Acts 26, I now stand here on trial because of my hope in the promise made by God to our fathers, to which our twelve tribes hope to attain as they earnestly worship night and day. And for this hope, I am accused by Jews, O king. Why is it thought incredible by any of you that God raises the dead? Now, I'm not terribly observant, but I noticed that the word hope occurs multiple different times in these verses. That Paul keeps talking about this hope. He's been arrested and he's standing in court because he has hope. Hmm. What is his hope? It's the promise made by God to our fathers. It's the hope that our 12 tribes hope to attain. It's the hope for which he's being accused right now by his fellow Judeans. But what is that hope? It's verse 8. Why is it so unbelievable that God raises the dead? Well, that's a reasonable question. <laughs> Why are we going to put limits on God's power and God's ability to do something like raise the dead? especially given that the Scriptures already record several resurrections, at least temporary resurrections. You know, Elijah raised the son of the widow in Zarephath. Um, the person buried in the grave with Elisha came back to life on touching his bones. <laughs> there are a number of these things recorded in Scripture already. And what Paul is saying is very re rational. No reason to limit God's power. But you see what it is, that's the hope that he's talking about. It all hangs upon resurrection from the dead from his perspective. But I don't want to lose our focus here. What we're getting at is that Paul, by doing this and by saying these things, is actually expanding the scope of the Old Testament's teaching about resurrection. It's not just Psalm 16 that David penned and that Peter referred to, as if, you know, the apostles were just picking and choosing, you know, grabbing a verse here or a proof text there to try and support their position. That's not the case. Towards the end of Paul's address to the court, he says, and still in Acts 26, but now down to verse 22. To this day, I've had the help that comes from God, and so I stand here testifying both to small and great, saying nothing but what the prophets and Moses said would come to pass, that the Christ must suffer, and that by being the first to rise from the dead, he would proclaim light both to our people and to the nations." When he talks this way, he's saying, this is nothing other than what has already been written in all of the Old Testament. The prophets were saying this. Moses was saying this. This is nothing new. I'm testifying, saying nothing but what the prophets and Moses said was going to happen. The Christ must suffer. 
and he will be the first to rise from the dead. Now, we just cited a number of examples where people were resurrected, at least temporarily. That's true. He's the first in the sense that he's the first to rise, never more to die again. He's the first to rise from the dead to this eternal life. But when he does this, he becomes the proclaimer of light, not just to the nation of Israel, but also to all the nations of the earth. So Paul is expanding the scope of the Old Testament, and it's not just that psalm from David. It includes everything written in Moses and the prophets. All of it is talking about there is a hope, there is a life after this one. The Lord has one who is his chosen king. That's the Christ. The Christ is just Greek for anointed one. The Lord's anointed which if you're, if you're a Bible student, you remember that Samuel was sent to anoint Saul, and then Samuel was sent to anoint David. And this is how God does it. He chooses his king with an anointing. Jesus is the anointed king, the one of God's choosing who has been put into place. And just as David was chased and persecuted by the deposed earthly king, so also Christ is being persecuted by the deposed earthly kingdom. But he, being the first to rise from the dead, is proclaiming light. All we're getting at is that, well, this expands it quite a bit. Actually, all of Scripture is indeed pointing to this. And it's also what Paul said in Romans 15, verse 4, just by itself, whatever was written in former days, was written for our instruction, so that through endurance and through the encouragement of what was written, we might have hope. That was written for our instruction. The Old Testament was written so that we would gain endurance and encouragement and that we would have hope. That's the whole purpose for it. You know, if, if we're thinking its purpose is to establish a, a nation on earth or to establish a bloodline, uh, you know, the 19th century is calling, man. That's, they, they want their way of thinking back. That's not the meaning of this. The point of this is that all of Scripture is intended to give the children of God, whoever they are, wherever they are, endurance and encouragement so that they would live life here in hope. All that happened to them happened so that we could see how it worked out. Those who were faithful and how they lived and what happened to them when they believed in God, when they trusted in God, when they obeyed God, what happened to them? How long did it take? You know, and if you know the Old Testament at all, you, you know a number of different accounts of different persons of faith who lived there. And yes, uh, of course, I will immediately go on to not include any Old Testament verses in this lesson <laughs> after reading how the Old Testament teaches this. Yeah, but the reason for that is this is a series on Hebrews 11, and the rest of the chapter is centered on these Old Testament figures. And in fact, the ones that we're about to read are also centered on Old Testament figures, okay? So let's look at Abraham and Sarah as the New Testament presents them. In the light of hope. They had a hope. They had something that sustained them through their time here. Oops, I set this down too soon. Romans chapter 4 is the first place we'll look at with regard to Sarah and Abraham. Abraham and Sarah, they had faith. They had hope. They trusted God that what he said was true, even if they didn't see it yet, even if they couldn't explain it. It didn't make sense to them. 
They didn't limit his power. As Paul said, why should it be thought impossible that God raises the dead? No reason to limit God's power. In Romans 4, at 17, 18, and 19, it says, God told Abraham, and it was recorded for us, I've made you the father of many nations in the presence of the God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. In hope he believed, against hope, that he should become the father of many nations. As he had been told, so shall your offspring be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead since he was about a hundred years old. Nor did he weaken in faith when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. Now, there's a few things in here which we'll pull out forthwith. First thing is, did you notice that once again, this hope has been centered on the fact in the 17th verse that God gives life to the dead and calls into existence things that do not exist. Hmm, that sounds familiar. <laughs> it's Hebrews 11, 1 and 2, isn't it? We're convinced of things not seen. We're sure. We're certain of things hoped for. They're real. God gives life to the dead. Resurrection is, is at the center of this, and they knew that. They believed that. Again, we'll have to talk about that in another lesson at another time, but it says, Abraham, the father of our faith, if you will, believed God gives life to the dead, and in the 18th, in hope, against hope, if you will. He believed, meaning he kept on believing. He kept up his faith in hope, contrary to expectation, meaning it's not what you would expect. If you're using human reasoning, you know, I've never seen anybody come back from the dead, and neither have you, and neither has anybody you know. But if you're using human reasoning, that's not going to happen. But he kept believing against hope, if you will, against expectation, contrary to what people might expect. He kept his faith, and his hope was in God. But his hope was also that he would become the father of many nations because God told him he would become the father of many nations. And he believed God when God said this to him. Even though in the, in the 19th verse, even though his own body was as good as dead. It was about 100 years old. And Sarah's womb was barren. In fact, it had always been barren. Throughout life, it had been barren. Sarah herself, I believe, is 10 years his junior. So I think she's maybe 90 when he's 100. Even if she had been able to have children in her 20s and 30s, she certainly wouldn't be able to have them in her 90s post-menopause. But she never was able to have children. She was barren. So if, if Abraham was thinking of himself, if Sarah was thinking of herself, that's contrary to hope. But he said in the 19th, he didn't weaken in faith when he considered his own body or when he considered Sarah's womb. His faith was unwavering. He still believed God because he knew the power was not in himself. And Sarah knew the power was not in herself, that the power was in God. And that's what Hebrews 11, verses 11 and 12 talk about, how good Sarah is. It says, by faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive, even when she was past the age, since she considered him faithful who had promised. Considered means reasoned or reckoned. God said you're going to have a child. Well, why would he lie? And why would his power be limited 
by my circumstances. She believed him and so received power to conceive, and she did. And here's Abraham and Sarah, and we just read in Romans 4 how that his body was as good as dead. It says, from one man and him as good as dead, because the same guy wrote both these letters, were born descendants as many as the stars of heaven. But it says, this one man as good as dead certainly did see the fulfillment, if you will. We, we see the fulfillment of these things in this man. There is an entire nation of Israel descended from Abraham through the son of promise, through Isaac, not just, not just through Ishmael, although there are many descendants through Ishmael who are today the sons of the east, but through Isaac, the son of promise, the son of their old age, the son of the power of God to raise the dead. But back in Romans 4, it's uh, 20 down to 24. No unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God, but rather he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. That's why his faith was considered righteousness. But the words it was considered were not written for his sake alone, but for ours too. It will be considered righteousness for us who believe in him, who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord. And it's a long uh, lesson to try to dig into this considering and counting. James 2 is the key to that where James points out that he's considered to be righteous while Isaac is growing up, but he's justified when he offers Isaac in sacrifice. But we too are considered to be righteous when we believe in him who raised Jesus from the dead. He was fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. That's the assurance of things hoped for. He was certain. The conviction of things unseen, and it's his testimony. Right? That's what we're getting at in Hebrews 11. Faith. What makes it? It's the assurance of the thing that you are hoping for. They were sure. The conviction of a thing not yet seen. They knew it was there. They knew it was real that God could do it, even though they hadn't seen it. And this faith is the reason that they have a testimony. That's why they're in this book, and we're reading about them today. The Holy Spirit testifies about them. The truth testifies about them. Okay. I feel that it is necessary to go through these verses together, but fairly quickly. In closing, in First Timothy, please look with me at what the apostle wrote to him, starting there at 1 Timothy 4. But what it comes down to is that hope today for us is a reason for us to work. He said in 1 Timothy 4, it's 7 down through 11. I've, I've, I've got the wrong page. There we go. Yes. Train yourself for godliness. While bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way. It holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. The saying is trustworthy and deserving full acceptance. To this end we toil and strive because we have hope set on the living God, 
who is the Savior of all people, especially those who believe. Command these things, teach these things. But Paul said, to this end we toil and strive, because we have set our hope on the living God. Why toil? Why strive? Why, why make an effort? Because it is an effort to live right. It's worthwhile effort. Why do it? Because there's hope. We have hope in God. We have hope. We know there's an eternity. We know there's a reckoning. There's going to be a judgment that's a right judgment, even if we don't get justice in this life. Remember what he said, bodily training is of some value. Godliness is of value in every way. Why toil and strive? Because it holds promise for present life and also the life to come. Bodily training holds promise only for the present life. Why would we toil and strive? For fitness? No. For hope, the life to come. And in the sixth chapter, he picks up this thread again. In the 17th verse, down through the 21st, he said, As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us everything to enjoy, there to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous, ready to share, thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future, so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. He said, we have a hope not on the uncertainty of riches, but on God. And that the reason for that hope is that we might take hold of what is truly life. You know, riches in this world allow you to, to you know, savor all the things that this world has to offer, but that's not true life. Hope in God gives us true life. That's why we toil and strive. That's what's worth doing. We toil and strive for the hope of the true life of God, not for wealth. And also, he said in closing, there it is. Oh, Timothy, guard the deposit entrusted to you. Avoid, avoid the irreverent babble and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. For by professing it, some have swerved from the faith. And again, why toil and strive? Is it for, you know, knowledge? In quotes, it's falsely called knowledge, so-called knowledge. No, no. We toil and strive for the knowledge of Christ. We toil and strive to know God and to be known by Him. When you look at Sarah and Abraham above, you know, earlier in the sermon, they're living by faith. They're toiling and striving. They're, they're living as strangers in a strange land because of their hope in God, their trust in God. And they were not disappointed, although they departed this earth, perhaps not having seen the full extent of those things, they certainly are in the presence of God. They certainly are blessed. So our hope is not in these earthly things. Our hope is in eternal things. And those are the things that we are sure of that give us staying power, that make it possible for us to keep on keeping on and keep going. There is a reason for us to keep going. There is a reason for us to live right in this life. There's a reason to endure. While living right, does have its own benefits in and of itself. Um, and it does. And there are many joys in this life of, of being a child of God, the fellowship of like-minded Christians, um, 
the freedom from a lot of consequences of things that people do when they don't know better. There's a whole lot of things. God listens to us in our prayers. We have the comfort of the Scriptures as well as the comfort of the Holy Spirit when we pray. Um, according to Romans uh, 8 and Romans 11, we talk about things like that. These are all real things, but it's also the case that we are looking forward to something, well, ineffable, something that we, we, nobody has ever seen, nobody can describe. But we know that it's there because God said that it's there, and His Word is powerful, and it has never failed. And those who trusted in Him were not disappointed, and you and I won't be either. If today you believe that Jesus is the Lord's anointed, that he is the king that God chose, have you obeyed him? Have you put him on in baptism for forgiveness of sins? That baptism is putting to death the old person of sin to be resurrected a new person in Christ Jesus. It gets its power through the resurrection of Jesus, 1 Peter 3, 21. We have water prepared that you might obey the gospel. If today you are a Christian but have not lived right, let us pray for you that you might be restored to him because we all of us need to contain or to maintain hope. We need to pray for one another. We need to be kind to one another in the Lord. And let's do that if if we can. If you need our prayers in, in the Lord, if you need to obey the gospel, please let your need be known now while together we stand and sing the song selected.